Mahal ke akua. Nau hani i ko ai. Mahalo awa kea e kane i ko ai. Mahalo e papa hanau moku e pai aina e ola mai. E mahalo e mahina le kuhimana i i ke mai. Mahalo e mahina nui e mai kapo a i ke au. Mahalo i a kākou he mana o pono he na au. Mahalo he mele nei e hula pā. O pono o pono. Thank you, great creator and the spirit in the water. Thank you to the sky father and Kāne. Thank you to the grandfather's son. And thank you to the woman that is the sea. And thank you to the earth mother in whom we all reside. And thank you to the grandmother moon. Bring us the time and tides. And thank you to the great grandmother who from space brings us the light. And thank you all of you for what you think is right and for how you feel. And thank you for the song and thank you for the dance and thank you for the time to heal. Mahalo ke akua e nau haniri koai. Thank you great creator and the spirit in the water. Mahalo, mahalo, mahalo. Mahalo Nui. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you for being on time for this, the 10th Breadfruit People webinar. Um, this is a very special one. We're focusing on the future of breadfruit. We've had quite a run. Uh, we've had, we've covered nine different topics in the past. We have had presenters from many countries, over 30 presenters. We've had over 500 uh, participants. And um, we have also had participants from over 40 countries. So it's a wide net, lots of participation, uh, lots of conversations, uh, inspiring uh, topics. And um, a lot of that information has been captured and put on the Breadfruit People website for those of you who um, haven't been to the breadfruitpeople.com website yet. It's a wonderful resource for not only the webinars, um, the recordings of the webinars and information related to the webinars, but many other things. Um, I would like to personally thank uh, PFON and here we have Kyle and Irene um, working on Breadfruit People and PFON in general for the opportunity to be here. I'm Craig Elovich. I'm here in Kona, uh, Hawaii. Uh, I have Auntie Shirley, who is a um, in the in the back back in in the background of many of our Ulu events here in Hawaii and around the world. She likes to be in the background, so she's not on screen here. Um, and so today we have an extraordinary lineup of panelists. I'm just going to go over the format a little bit. We're using a, a panelist format, so we will go around with questions for, for the panelists, and we will um, move quickly from panelist to panelist and answer two pre-prepared pre questions. Um, and then we will have time to answer your questions. So we're hoping that you will engage through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. The Q&A box is where you can put in your questions and um, create this interactive uh, um, interactivity with the panelists, which is after all why we're doing this as a live event. So please feel free as questions come to your mind, put them in the Q&A box. And if you, if you like, um, uh, put your location, maybe just name your location with the question so we get a little context. And so after we've done the pre-prepared questions, we will go to your questions. And um, let's see here. So um, 
We have 90 minutes today and many of our webinars have gone a little bit over. So we won't feel bad if you have to leave at half past the second hour. Uh, we understand um, there's no, no hard feelings, um, but if we go long, uh, feel free to stay or leave whatever works for you. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be made available, as I mentioned earlier, uh, through the breadfruitpeople.com website. And there's a breadfruit people, uh, breadfruit people YouTube channel where these video assets are, are, um, are kept and available. And I want to mention with thanks that this uh, series of webinars is funded through the Farmers Organizations for Africa, Caribbean, and the Pacific program, which is a joint partnership between the EU, ACP, IFAD, and PFON. So it's a wonderful thing that we've been able to do these. And again, thank you everyone for joining us. I'm going to introduce our panelists briefly. And then we're going to get going uh, on the questions. Um, our, I will uh, first introduce Floris Niu. Uh, she's founder of Miss Sunshine Farms, co-founder of Samoa Women's Association of Growers, a founding member of the Samoa Cocoa Industry Association, and currently represents the Pacific Farmers Voice in the Global Advocacy Group Indigenous Peoples Major Group. She is a full-time farmer from Upolu, Samoa, and currently in uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand. So thank you so much for joining us. Floris was with us two webinars ago, and um, we, we've invited her back. And thank you again for your time. Uh, we know you're so busy. We have Kyle Stice. He's a tropical horticulture specialist with over 15 years experience in commercial agriculture and agricultural development in the Pacific. Kyle has extensive experience in breadfruit ap applied research, industry development and strategic planning. Kyle is currently the breadfruit people coordinator through the Pacific Island Farmers Organization Network or PFON. So thank you so much, Kyle. It's been such a pleasure working with you and thank you for being here. We have uh, uh, Kalani Souza, who I, we've worked with, Auntie Shirley and I, for a long time. Um, he is a Hawaiian practitioner and cross-cultural facilitator. He's known throughout the Pacific and uh, throughout the world. His native roots allow him a unique perspective of the collision of two worlds, one steeped in traditional culture, the other forwarding new economic and political paradigms. Kalani directs Olohana Foundation, which works to organize and support Pacific Islanders in addressing climate change, microenterprise development, and community resilience through multi-generational knowledge systems combined with modern science. Mahalo Nui for joining us, Kalani. It's a true pleasure. We have Dr. Falau Tusia. Avangalio. He is director of the Pacific Business Center program at the Scheidler College of Business at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. He's, he's also well known throughout the Pacific um, and the world, and he's best known as Doc Tusi for short. He is a Pacific Islander and advocate for the holistic and systems and systems-based development. Dr. Tusi has consulted extensively throughout the Pacific for traditional leaders and village councils of Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia within the cultural context of their orga organic worldview, balanced with Western perspectives. His work seeks to reconcile and weave the perspectives of traditional wisdom and culture with modern science, knowledge, and technology. And it's a great pleasure and honor to have Dr. Tusi and all of you with us. We have another uh, presenter. Um, you may have um, um, seen her in previous webinars as well, Dr. Laura Roberts and Pruma. She, uh, for whatever reason, technical perhaps, is not, has not joined us yet, but I'm going to introduce her um, up front. 
here. Um, Dr. Laura Roberts and Kruma is a professor of crop science and production within the Department of Food Production at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine's Faculty of Food and Agriculture in Trinidad and Tobago. She has an, she has an outstanding career as a scientist, agriculturalist, and Caribbean pioneer in the study and cultivation of breadfruit. So hopefully she will join us soon. We'll begin with our pre-prepared questions. Um, these are meant to um, start off the conversation. As I said, please ask your questions in the Q&A box as they come up. Um, our very first question is, what is your ideal future for breadfruit? And um, I'd like to start with Floris, if, if, if we may. Good morning, kia ora, talo falava, mahalo, and uh, bulavinaka. Warm Pacific greetings here from Auckland. I'm still stuck in Auckland after being here for about seven, eight months now and promoting our women farmers uh, calendar in New Zealand. Um, but I am supposed to go back home very soon. So I'm very much looking forward to getting back on the farm. Um, thank you, Craig, and thank you everyone and all the sponsors of this event uh, for the opportunity to come and speak. Um, from a farmer's perspective, um, from a very humble perspective, because I'm not a trained farmer, I didn't study agriculture, but I certainly, um, the land called me, um, my ancestors called me, and through tragedy, I was able to go back to my um, indigenous, indigenous land in Samoa. And there I was met with um, humongous and tremendous learnings that the land was able to, to, um, to pass on to me through my experiences in um, organic growing and growing my cacao. Um, and of course, you know, all of the traditional crops like breadfruit um, on our land. So when you ask me the question, what is the ideal future or my ideal future for breadfruit? Um, and it's the same answer for all of the traditional crops that we have and that I've been trying to work for over eight years now in promoting and sustaining. And that is, I feel very strongly that the future for breadfruit and all of our traditional crops is the present. It's what we're doing right now. It's uh, the, having these types of dialogues and conversations and you know helping to bring together our people um, to help revive and 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 bring to the fore our traditional foods and um, revive our traditional ways of doing and ways of being and going back and eating from our cultural landscapes and that's really for me um, what I'm excited about because we're already doing the work of the future we're already, um, you know, beginning to bring our uh, communities and cultures and, and people together to um, really reflect on um, our health um, and, and try to combat some of the, um, I guess I, I would call it a decolonizing of the social conditioning of our foods. And, um, and, and what that means to me is that We've been brought up in many different lands, even though for myself, I was born in Samoa, I was brought up with breadfruit and, you know, that to be the food that sustains and nourishes me as, the, as a child. And when you get put into a different land in a different space um, where there is different uh, foods that grows there or different foods that is introduced into your diet, um, something happens, you know, to our DNA and something happens to us, we, we get, we, we go so far away and disconnect eventually from our cultural foods and our cultural landscapes. Um, and I guess that's the thing that for me, um, what people are awakening to today um, is the conversation that this needs to bring us back to our cultural landscapes, to bring back um, the conversation of breadfruit, um, cassava, taro, and all of these foods that is 
the food that nourishes us um, wholly and keeps us healthy. Um, and that's what I try to do in my work um, as far as promoting, you know, the recipes for breadfruit, um, promoting the life that we had previously as young children, what our memories were like, um, you know, with breadfruit, um, and also understanding that anyone not just uh, scientists or, you know, uh, chefs and uh, educated people, but anyone who picks up a breadfruit and starts to cook with it and starts to nourish themselves with it is an expert on breadfruit because they've already connected themselves back to their cultural food, to their traditional and cultural landscapes. So I think to me, what we're already doing today by um, expanding on this conversation, um, online, it, you know, media is, is, is such a, you know, powerful um, thing. And, and I think just doing this and, and um, you know, writing our recipe books and sharing all of this knowledge and, and the sharing the passion that, that comes from, um, you know, having eaten and created products out of this food and then, you know, um, sharing that with in your restaurant or in your tours or however um, that we're already doing it today. I think we've started the future of the breadfruit. And I think the very key is in the title of your organization, people, um, breadfruit people, you've already started this movement. And I think this is the future um, for, for a breadfruit for now. Yeah. Mm. Thank you that so much, wonderful. Flora. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's go to Kyle and, uh, Kyle, I know you've been working on not only this series of webinars, but, um, so many things related to breadfruit for many, many years. And, um, I really look forward to your, your vision of the future of breadfruit. Yeah, great. Um, thank you so much. And it's an honor to, uh, to be here and to have uh, so much wisdom. Um, I just want to kind of reflect on this question from a little bit of a different angle. That's okay. And this is to kind of share a little bit about kind of the, what I think is the, the future for our, for our breadfruit people. So, you know, we've got this amazing movement that's been developing in breadfruit really over the last 20 years in all of these small corners of the Pacific and of the Caribbean. And every once in a while, our worlds collide and we, and we get an opportunity to, to learn what each other is doing. But then we kind of go back to our little island and, and we continue on with our work in a little bit of a, of a silo. And um, I shared this uh, personal experience before uh, while I was working with Nature's Way Cooperative in, in 2005, I was developing this, bread, uh, this manual on breadfruit and the target was farmers and, and exporters. And um, it, was, it was amazing how little practical information was available about breadfruit, you know, production, harvest, post-harvest handling, marketing. And um, we, we really had to search to find information. And then miraculously, I learned uh, that the International Society for Horticulture Sciences, the IHS, was hosting its, its breadfruit symposium. And it was happening in the same town where I was living. And so um, uh, as a young uh, agriculturalist, I submitted a paper, I made a presentation, and I, and I met some of the most amazing people some of the most amazing researchers and, and practitioners working on breadfruit from, from all over the world. And, and I was just inundated with information and the relationships and the networks that I developed, I've utilized over the last 17 years in a very practical sense. And I guess for me, that was the, that was the start of this, this, uh, this passion in me to, to foster these kind of networks this idea of, of working together, of, of sharing information, and particularly connecting up those farmers, those researchers, those businesses who are really isolated, who are on little tiny islands. They're, they're corners 
It's a very small place that's not naturally connected by land or, or other channels. Like me, they're scanning for information, scanning for inspiration. So, so my vision for, for, for Breadfruit and, and for our Breadfruit People Network is that collectively we can, we can become a beacon of light, that we can become a, a source of information, a source of inspiration, a source of, of community, of connectivity for all those who are involved in, in this movement in all their little corners of the world, but also as a means for attracting more people to engage uh, in this amazing breadfruit movement. So I guess that's kind of my uh, ideal future for, for, for breadfruit people. And um, uh, I'm just so blessed to, to be along for the ride. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. That's really wonderful. Um, I hadn't heard you put it all together that way. So that, that's really exciting. Um, let's go to uh, now Kalani. And um, Kalani and I have, as I mentioned before, worked on breadfruit and many other things, agroforestry for a long time. And um, I'm uh, really excited to hear you express your vision about um, where breadfruit can go. And I know it's always a little bit, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I wanna say, first of all, I certainly support both of those previous iterations. You know what I mean? Especially Flores, I love the idea of this, what we're doing in the present moment of extending our ability to communicate to each other about not just needs, but possibilities, you know, and then to create a network as it were, you know, a network of networks that's able to work with each other around both localized delivery of capacity, as well as like a large regional effort, right? So I think I see breadfruit in the future, breadfruit in this uh, real forward lensing, as it were, right? I don't think we've discovered everything there is to discover about the ulu trees, you know, the, the may. Um, for example, I think if we're talking about the future, I think what we really need is we need an answer to the microplastics that are causing a, a default within the food chain in the ocean as they break down because they never break down. They just turn into these fractalized particles. So we really need to uh, get them out of the ocean and work on what, what we're gonna do about that. And I mentioned that because single use plastics in terms of the health industry, as we can see with these global pandemics is a necessity so the idea of having organic plastic, you know, something that is in fact biodegradable and can break down, but is, has that same tensile strength. I believe the latex in Ulu has the ability to do this. And we're not doing research at those far edges about what the marketplace really is. Now saying something like that, you know, a far flung idea where we outlaw petrol cheap third grade crude you can't make cheap plastic anymore you got to make biodegradable plastic out of a product that comes out of the old trees right as they age and we're taking out if we can find ways to extract it like maple syrup from a living tree that really makes sense but beyond that ulu needs to be grown in relationship deeply with the rest of the food forest. It's an interesting teacher as a kupuna, right? It's like, it sits in the forest surrounded by all the other trees, right? The Maya, right? And, and even the root crops all moving in and it lets the sunlight in. It's not like a big monkey pod where it's killing everything. It's literally in relationship with everything that's going on that provides a sense of food security. We have to ensure into the future that we never monocrop ulu or 
present these problems that the monocropping industry creates, you know, where they're planting orchards and creating pathogens we've never seen before. So using Ulu as both a community education piece and a way of thrusting forward this new relationality with our environment, with the ecology, or as we think of it, with our relatives, you know, with our, with our other akua that is in place and having this deep and abiding relationship around the diversity of life and the web. And not to mention it creates all the other crops for our immediate community marketplace. <laughs> One thing I want to add to that too is uh, we should stop this idea of the, the top 10% or 20% of our crop is bartered away to, you know, what in effect is the shrewdest, lowest bidder who takes advantage of the local farmers. Rather, the top 15, 20% of the crop should stay home with the community as food. We should create organizations that ensure, you know, grade B is, is what we're selling to the consumer market that's off to make flour and all else, including alcohol on their way out. And why aren't we harvesting the waste product? You know, the 65, 70% of ulu that hits the ground could be har harvested by a joint effort of the governments in Micronesia and Polynesia and Melanesia together and brought to uh, distilling areas that are regionally based. Like, for example, Tutuila's tuna company, they're going to need a new future. We could create a fuel extraction that happens from the waste of all the different islands. We're sending it on the boat while it's sitting in the mash, right, and getting to harbor and uploading the Ulu that's fermenting and creating pharmaceutical alcohol for our medical needs, as well as hydrocarbon fuel for our fishing boats and our fishing vessels. I think we're only just discovering the future of Ulu, right? And we need imagination and we need relationship with each other so we can show in the Pacific how we're all interrelated. The ocean connects us, not separates us. Right. And how do we use what others perceive as a waste product? How do we use it in transit across the ocean already processing in a mash into uplift at these fuel stations that get distributed to the island and we become energy self-sufficient along with solar wind and this liquid hydrocarbon? I think we'd be uh, in a real interesting position. Thank you. Mahalo. Wow. Wonderful. That's a pretty good place. Yeah. Auntie, Auntie Shirley's really excited about what you said. Um, so let's go to Doc Tusi, please. <laughs> oh, mute. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Craig. Um, uh, really uh, appreciated uh, the comments and, uh, you know, Kalani spot on. The, um, I think one of the unique uh, roles that I play is that I'm not from, I'm not involved with agriculture at all at the university. I'm housed at the uh, Scheidler College of Business at, on, on, on the main campus in Manoa. So our focus is, is not necessarily agriculture per se, but it's economic development. Uh, what I bring to the table is that most of the uh, literature and most of the models at the College of Business are basically industrial based, based on Western paradigms, Western models. I appreciate the opportunity to be invited originally as a lecturer, now as an associate professor, now as a director. So I'm able to now introduce, and it's take 10 years, a different perspective. And that perspective is the organic perspective. And, uh, and uh, from living cultures, they were, not, they were not part of the literature. 
So people were based many of their models on Western science and Western models of development. And then they transferred these models and taught it to people in developing areas to use the same models when actually their way of thinking is completely opposite. So over time, I, I, I really had the, the great opportunity and I think the blessings, and I humbly say this because otherwise uh, what I had to say would have never reached the ears that needed to hear them. And now we're at a place where uh, some of my colleagues at one time thought I was nuts. They would tease me like, are you talking to the trees again? Uh, kind of thing. And uh, now they are reading the literature. Our greatest scientists, uh, now we have issues, uh, scientists like quantum mechanics. Guess what? Fundamental to, to Pacific wisdom is that all things are connected. Well, quantum mechanics is now say the most fundamental material in the universe is not matter, according to uh, to many of the scientists uh, during the Enlightenment. It's energy, and that energy is can be charged in many different ways. This is why in Hawaii they call it ike. It's a sensing of the energy. In Samoa, it's called iike. It's the sensing of those things not readily apparent to others. And I now understand why my grandfather told me when we go and, and to look for a tree, we sit down in and sit around the circle and we talk to the tree. He didn't mean talk. He actually meant sensing. I didn't figure this out there years later. But anyway, my point is this perspective is important. Our perspective is important. And we need to never forget that it's, it's millenniums old. This is wisdom and we need to build on it, not push it aside and replace it with something else. So I, what I'm seeing, I love this organization. I love what's happening because one of the greatest challenges we have is our, our youth are not being exposed sufficiently. So what is happening? We are having knowledge outrun wisdom. But it's our responsibility to, to advance, to be present, to be visible, so that wisdom can actually take its proper place. And that's together with knowledge. And together we can build a foundation for learning and for feeling responsibility and doing the right thing with the next generation. Otherwise, we're sort of wasting our time. The future depends on the goodness of the inside that comes out, not the outside in, is it? Well, anyway, uh, getting back to, to the original question. Sorry, Craig, I sort of uh, drifted off there. The model that I have been promoting is, is um, replacing the extractive degenerative development model of economic development. You know what that is? That's the model they use. They take from the ground and then uh, until it's completely taken, what happens? The environment then degenerates and then they move on and plug it into another area and extract again. They take, take, take. That's the regenerative, that's the, 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 the extractive degenerative models. The models of our ancestors, you ever wonder how People can live in an atoll for centuries. You know, atoll only has so much energy in, in, the, in the soil. Uh, I imagine if some people from Arkansas were to live there, they'd be all dead because they would have extracted everything, used it up, and their demise would have been apparent. But our ancestors learn it's regeneration. What you take from the earth you must replace back every, all the energies must be replaced. And that keeps, that's the foundation for the living things of which your life depends on. So this, that regenerative model somehow got lost simply because there's a belief there's an abundance out there. It's like going after the Buffalo in the Midwest. They killed millions of them because they thought that it's never ending. Well, guess what? It's an endangered species. 
So the same thing with, with what we're doing here. So what am I looking at replacing it? Nothing new, it's not, I don't claim anything, but I do credit the wisdom of my ancestors, our ancestors. So the model that I'm encouraging is, is restorative, regenerative economic development. So when you take, you put back, you restore, and it regenerates the environment. And so we can continue living on our little atoll for as long as we like, so long as we maintain the balance. Um, what I also see in the future is survival, um, a greater strengthening of, of our core wisdoms, our core values of respect and aloha for our natural kin greater self-reliance, and greater regional collaboration. It, the, no one can move alone on this. Um, we've seen what happened when the, when the uh, supply chains broke. Hawaii depends on 90% imports on food. <laughs> what happens if those supply chains aren't reconnected in over a year. Uh, we may develop new cuisines for human legs. We're gonna have to depend on other things. You can, if you take something from a shelf in a shop, a store, it doesn't grow back. You pick ulu, breadfruit, it'll grow back. Okay, and so, uh, developing agroforests, we must be able to build and grow and, and return back to the models that have sustained survival of our peoples in the islands for millenniums. It's as simple as that. Uh, together, we also need to uh, work with technologies that help support regenerative development. And we're currently working with projects like that. Um, we shouldn't be talking about the roof and, and, and the type of furniture we're going to design our living rooms with unless the foundation is in place. What is the foundation? Water and soil. Those two things are the foundation for everything that lives and thrives on the island. So right now, when we need to be careful, when we're importing tons of chemical-based fuels that are synthetic, we're having water issues already. Well, we've got to be working with those kinds of uh, inventors and innovators that can come up with these regenerative types of solutions of which we are, but that's, a, that's another topic at another time. We also need, uh, I, I'm seeing that we need I think the opportunity is coming where we're not just focused on the breadfruit and the breadfruit flower. That actually is just only one of the multiple blessings and gifts that the breadfruit can provide. Um, I just uh, was uh, coordinating with one of our, our scientists, our researchers. One of the advantages being a university is we're networked to a lot of scientific and ag uh, pro uh, universities throughout the nation. Plant protein is, a, is high demand for foods and it's a multi-billion dollar industry. In fact, chickpeas is uh, this grow up miles and square miles, particularly in the North, in Canada and the Midwest. It's a primary source of, 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 of uh, protein, plant-based protein. Well, guess what our, our biochemist scientists uh, have discovered? Breadfruit has more plant protein than chickpeas. So keeping that in mind, we can move over to the gluten-free and low glycemic index. Breadfruit is probably, has the lowest low glycemic carbohydrate uh, of all the other foods. The number one killer in the Pacific is diabetes, renal disease, heart disease. It's food-based and breadfruit as a flower can, can do amazing things. The, the gluten-free um, uh, low glycemic index 
uh, projections uh, for by Grandview Research Incorporation, which we work in when we look at different markets, is $43.65 billion by 2027. So the demand is out there. They're not gonna, okay, and then, and then let's take a look at organic pesticide. Um, the US Department of uh, Agriculture and the US Department of Defense were, were trying to test this, this old wives tale they heard or in the Pacific Islands where dried uh, the flower of the breadfruit was burnt and then the smoke was used to chase away the, 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 the mosquitoes. So they actually tested, guess, guess what the results were? It came out in 2013. The, the smoke from the, 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 we call it the fugue, uh, the, the dried breadfruit flower had four compounds more potent than DEET, the synthetic pesticide. So if you're looking at these, and then the, of course, the one I, I, I love to talk about is that uh, in the cosmetics industry, the most high demand moisturizer that they seek is called squalene. You know what the primary source of squalene is? The liver of sharks. And so if you've seen any of these uh, documentaries where they capture sharks, they cut it up, they pull out the, the liver, and then they throw the rest of the body back into the ocean. So what happens is that just, just, just uh, if you get a thousand, if you get one ton of, of squalene uh, livers from sharks, that's almost 1.6 million sharks that are slaughtered to get that. Of course, there's a lot of activism now, but, but the, the amazing things, again, our biochemist partners and our researchers from different universities identified, guess what has, they were looking for a plant source for squalene and they discovered it in the fungi, the, the breadfruit flower and the leaves. So that is a, 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 a organic pesticide source. And they've also worked on squalene. And now I, I, I read several articles that were brought to my attention. It's not being used for uh, cancer research. The leaves and the, the inflorescent has anti-cancer abilities, among other things. So the research is, is, is humongous. Uh, in fact, they're also looking at the uh, squalene as a potential ingredient in COVID-19 uh, uh, um, vaccines. So there are multiple gifts here. And I think if we're in a position to fully develop them, we cannot do it alone. We must do it as a region. Because uh, these larger uh, industries, if you can't guarantee 50,000 tons a month, they really <laughs> they can't work with you. And the only way you can do that is if the region works together. I think we can, we can do that and more, but I think uh, this is why this organization is so vital because only by working together can we be able to secure a good future for all of us. I love that uh, Kalani uh, every so often points out that uh, alone, you can go fast, but together we can go far. And I think our future, if we, again, realign with the wisdoms that have, have guided the survival of our people for millenniums, um, is a clear cut opportunity to improve the, not only the quality of our lives, but also our survival as people. So, Greg. Did I take too much time? Sorry. Not at all. Mahalo nui, Doc. And I'm sure um, no offense to our lovely audience in Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, thank you so much for that. And, and um, I'm uh, always, always inspired to hear your vision. So we've gone through, um, I, I guess Dr. Nkrumah is hasn't joined us yet. So we will um, go to our second question and we'll go back to Flores. And this, this question is about the lessons that we've learned. And so what lessons have we learned about breadfruit in the past that can inform our next steps? And I'm sure that applies to many of the crops that you're working with. And so I look forward to your response. 
Thank you, Craig, and thank you, Dr. Bali'i, and thank you, uh, Kalani. Uh, wow, I am in awe of the wisdom that you bring today and that you're sharing. And, um, and now, after hearing both of you speaking, I know for sure that I'm not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> because um, I think when I went back to Samoa and I started to do these things and I re was really uh, trusting and letting the land kind of lead me um, into all of my learnings to be an organic grower and to be a conscious grower. Um, it, it's actually how, because of that experience, it's how I've actually formed or formulated my philosophy around living and growing and that's uh, being a planet conscious um, grower and um, and being um, and what that really means in terms of everything that I grow and do um, whether it's on the commercial side or whether it's on the land or whether it's to do with the women's groups that I bring together and the people that I impact um, with the food um, because everything is central to the food and the people. And breadfruit has been one of those things, um, one of those beautiful ingredients that um, so many people just underestimate it. And as uh, Dr. Pali has just pointed out on many of the researches that he's been working on um, or being carried out around the world, um, that we're so spoiled with um, one simple crop and all of these uh, gifts that that we um, you know that is is within there for us only needs us and our wisdom to to elevate that and to recognize it. And I think that's uh, for me as a um, as a farmer and an organic grower and a lover of the planet and the land. Um, my perspective is that my, the learnings that I've had. Um, what I've learned, what I feel like most people have learned um, from the past in terms of these foods, um, which could be seen as endangered foods, to me, um, is that we just simply need to plant more. We just simply need to go back. Um, and as Dr. Papali has, has mentioned, we need to listen to, you know, the wisdom of our ancestors and do as they did and that's our and it comes from our innate knowing and being you know doing the things that we feel like I did experience on the land that talking to the trees was not making me a crazy woman um, it was actually me innately connecting to where I belong and to where I needed to get my learnings and my my um, I guess my compass bearings at, at that time in my life and and I think when you when you think and you elevate other plant because to me plants uh, are beings you know are living beings themselves and they have just as much right to survival as we do because we as humans we're constantly demanding survival for ourselves and so to have respect in terms of growing and, and allowing for the survival of those other plants and foods that we require um, is essential in, in any conversation. One of the other things that came up to mind um, after hearing uh, these wonderful gentlemen speak is um, that we need to tell these stories. We need to tell more stories about, um, we need to make space and create spaces to tell more of our breadfruit stories, of all of our crops that are in danger of um, extinction or of you know not being recognized by us, especially us in the region and us, the traditional uh, knowledge holders or um, of these crops, because we our ancestors passed that that wisdom and that knowledge down to us. So it's our responsibility um, as a people to carry that forward and to you know, bring um, a collective uh, future for, for the crops. Um, one of the cool things, and I might be going offline a little bit, um, that I've done because I've also 
you know, looked at, we're always harvesting, you know, the land and the, and the trees are constantly giving, giving and giving to us. And what are we giving back? So one of the ways that I thought of elevating um, breadfruit itself is I decided to use it in my fale Samoa, which is a traditional um, meeting house or fale, which they traditionally used breadfruit um, uh, wood. So um, it's a particular type of breadfruit and um, we uh, by hand uh, manipulated it and it's becoming part of the frameworks of the actual roof of the of the fale and that's the way that the the old um, our ancestors did it so um, I'm really proud of of that because a lot of people in my village were kind of why are you doing that you should just burn the things you know because I didn't want to waste it and I said I'm building this fale and this fale is going to hold um, important meetings for the tourists that will come to, to my land and people that come to gather together to enjoy food and more feasting and, and, and fellowship um, uh, with traditional food involved. And, and I really wanted to make that space completely um, uh, traditional and, and, and part of the ancestry of that particular area and that land where it came from. Um, and I think um, when people were commenting on why I was doing that, I actually uh, talked to my ancestors on the land and I said, you know, I know I'm doing the right thing. And I felt really good that I was reusing that, you know, the materials and not wasting it. And so it's wonderful to hear that there are so many different ways that we can, you know, recycle and, um, and, and use the waste product, um, which is not really waste product <laughs> to me. Um, and so I think going back to the question, um, what I simply, and, and I think it's, for me, I always try to think simply about um, the things that I'm doing and, and what comes to me always is that we just need to plant more. We need to elevate and we need to teach our young people how to plant more and how to make them, to educate them on the importance of this and why our ancestors did the things that they did, um, whether it's growing organically or just uh, being aware and connected to our land and our crops. Um, yeah, so teaching others to, to how to grow food and to grow with love and respect, which is kind of echoed by what the other uh, two panelists have said before and I think that whole love and respect is a is a really key factor in my in the work that I do um, and when I'm teaching people how to prune trees and how to take care or manage their crops um, I'm always talking to them from that perspective from you need to look at the tree as it as like your wife or your son or your daughter you know it's someone that you're nurturing and nourishing every day every day and it's no different when you're taking care of of these trees they will turn around and take care of you um, and I think everything has to be done from that very much planet conscious um, you know uh, awareness yeah so I hope that answers the question sorry <laughs> gone off topic yes wonderful so perfect um, okay, we'll go to Kyle and uh, please share with you uh, us the breadfruit people perspective on this. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Craig, and thanks everyone. I I, um, I really liked when Craig uh, proposed this question. You know, what lessons have we learned about breadfruit in the past, and how can this inform our our next steps? And uh, again, I just want to reflect a little bit on where we are with the breadfruit people. So over the, over the past three months, we've been carrying out this uh, strategic planning or this, this visioning process for, for breadfruit people. And um, I want to thank all of you who have uh, contributed to this process. And, and the results have been really encouraging. Um, and um, firstly, we've been able to kind of define the values of our network. Um, and I'm just gonna uh, share my screen if that's okay. Um, so when we um, when we talk about the um, 
the values of our network, we're really talking about the, the roots or the, or the foundation. And um, um, going back to your question, you know, what have we learned about our past and how will it shape our future? And I think one of the things that we've learned from so many of our organizations, from so many of our groups and our movements is that their success and their longevity is often determined by their values or lack thereof. So for, for, for us, this is the most important part of our Breadford People Network are these values. And these have been, have been co-developed and discussed and then finally agreed on. And you can see them uh, reflected there in the, um, uh, uh, in, the, in the bottom of that uh, uh, picture. And uh, um, um, then we wanted to focus some attention on, on the network. So we have the roots, the values. Then we wanted to focus some attention on the people and the organizations that make up Breadfruit people, and these are these are depicted there in the uh, in the in the in the branches of the Breadfruit people. And again, I think the lesson from the past is that we we can't think of crops or or products uh, in isolation or or in silos. And this has uh, become very clear from from all of the speakers today. Um, is that we have to be inclusive and diverse. So when you look at the, the Breadfruit People Network, the, the, the branches of our network consists of farmers, of educators, of researchers, business people, policy makers. We're all connected and our, and our long-term success really depends on our ability to collaborate. And I think that this is an important lesson of our of our past, you know, uh, I come out of um, uh, a movement of farm organizations, and it's so critical that farmers are working together. But of course, our value chains and, and the, the, the communities that we exist in, they don't just exist of farmers, but there's all of these other people. And to, to be successful, uh, we, we have to uh, um, uh, engage and, and interact, and therefore our network also has to have that, that diversity. And um, we heard it today from, from Dr. Tusi, uh, and, and he was quoting uh, Kalani, and I quote Dr. Tulusi, Dr. Tusi when we say, you know, alone we can go fast and, and together we can go far. And I think that that's really important when it comes to this, this breadfruit network. And then finally, we explored what are the actions of our network? What are the activities? And those are depicted in that picture as the, the fruit. And for us to ensure that our actions and our activities are in line with our values, because sometimes our organization says these are our values, but then the fruit or the actions look a lot different. So we've, we've mapped out a little bit of a way forward for our, our little network. And I, and I think it's rooted in some strong values and a lot of that has been captured today. And the focus is on supporting and connecting breadfruit people to amplify the voices of our breadfruit people, to amplify their wisdom, to amplify their experiences. And it might seem simple, but I think it's, an important role in this incredible movement. And it will be powerful if we can continue to, to foster this kind of engagement uh, that we've seen over you know, the last year of these webinars and, and connecting people, people sharing um, uh, out of a, a, a place of generosity uh, and, uh, and, and this idea of reciprocity. So I'm very excited about the future. And uh, each time I engage with the breadfruit people, it inspires me more and more. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. Wonderful.
Okay, um, let's move on to Kalani. Hey, thank you. Um, let me see. Um, what we learned from the past, I think, to touch on the subject lightly, is the exploitive nature of the commercial market. It's, I, I hope we all learn the lesson uh, about the fragile nature of our relationships and our interconnectivity. Um, I don't think since the British came to Tahiti and loaded up the breadfruit to head to the Caribbean, I don't think there's been a moment when they haven't looked at the peoples of the Pacific and thought, okay, how do we make money off of these guys, right? All the way down to Waikiki and the big tourist industry that happens and the coconut shells and the dancing girl and all the stuff that we know we put up with because it's just the economy, stupid. You know what I mean, as the American president said. But it's not just the economy, right? The future we're looking at needs to knit together the cohesive capacity of community to be regenerative and self-sustaining. So this means reinforcing women and children in economic development, a very regional place-based economic development driven by the needs of, frankly, young mothers, right? If we look at these economic models, differently if we stop trying to express ourselves by the need of the GDP, right, and the advancing of the collective profit of the marketplace so that the government can borrow more money to sink us further into commercial debt, I think we would actually create a different kind of society with different education systems. And I think it's that important what we do together as the breadfruit people, that we network and stitch um, a relationship and a camaraderie and a joint capacity throughout the Pacific and Oceania that supersedes, you know, those boundaries of greed and commerce. So how do we create cultures of gifting and ignore these cultures of commerce? while reinforcing an economic model that keeps our children fed, our old people comfortable, and our women unafraid. It seems like a tall order, but I always think the more complex the problem, the simpler the solution. So we ought to just like kind of get together and dig into that value set about how we move forward together. Mahalo. Mahalo Nuri Kalani. Okay, Doc, please. Unmute, unmute. Uh, the, um, I think I, I always go back to a time when, um, when, when I was sitting in a theory class and they were talking about uh, the worldview and the, the worldview being, uh, so what do you mean the worldview? How do people view the world? And then the emphasis was on, of course, the Western perspective, the world the worldview. And then uh, that's where I was acquainted with the word reductionist thinking, the, you know, breaking things into its smallest parts and then, you can pull that part and from there, you can generalize the whole. So essentially it came out to the whole, the perspective was, and this is what drove industrial and economic development for century, centuries is a belief that it is the parts that make up the whole. And I was learning that, so I was really buying into it because I love the, I love the philosophy until I realized um, that there are some other perspectives, which to my surprise, represented the views that I've always felt 
and believed in, but was sort of kind of reluctant to share because I thought it was really weird. And, uh, you know, being a young academic, you wanted uh, you, the tendency was to conform. Anyway, um, I now realize we don't see the parts that make up the whole. That's not our worldview culturally, traditionally. It may have been modified by impact, but I now have a, a very comfortable belief and sense that we don't see the parts that make up the whole. Our world sees the whole that organizes the parts. It's a completely opposite per perspective. So our worldview of the whole that makes up the parts is more systemic, a more uh, systems. It's more holistic so that we are more inclusive. Uh, let me give you an example of a lesson from the past. <laughs> and that is, um, let's take uh, some fundamental words. In Samoa, when I was a child, there, the, 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 the afterbirth of the umbilical cord was wrapped up in tea leaves, and then it was buried into a certain place on the land. Okay, I didn't know what that meant until much later. I do know what it means now, so. And then my grandmother said, come, let me teach you some words. And then, uh, so the word was fanua. In Hawaii, it's honua. The modern term for fanua is, um, is land or property. In ancient Samoan, fanua meant, meant afterbirth. So I says, really? Yeah. And, and, and she also went on to uh, the word ele ele and pala pala and said, what are those? I said, so she asked me, and I said, well, the, you know, I always knew ele ele and pala pala to mean dirt and mud. And she says, no, the ancient definition of ele ele and pala pala is blood. And then so she said, what is ma? And I said, stone, <laughs> that's the modern word we use. And she said, no, the word ma comes from the word fatu ma, which means heart. So what she was pointing out to me, I, of course I didn't conceptually grasp that. It wasn't until years later that I reflected and I realized what she had just shared with me. Of course, grandma's long passed away. But what she told, what now I understand, those were the terms of a living earth, the afterbirth, the blood, the heart. That was the description. And then I realized that by wrapping it in the tea leaf and burying it into the ground, metaphorically, that means my umbilical is connected to the earth. So I have two mothers, my biological birth mother and my mother, the earth. And you know, it was interesting. So I went on to university uh, for many, many years, but I always realized that I always was uncomfortable when I see destruction of, of land of any kind. In fact, I was at a friend's ranch in Kansas and they were bulldozing a, a large tree, knocking it down. I couldn't watch it. And she said, what's wrong? I said, oh man, I feel sick. I, I had to turn away. When I see earth movements and they're moving them, I, I really get uncomfortable. And so I try to avoid it. The lesson here is that as we put together our organizations, that we not just think about our human relationships, that we collaborate with people with different points of view, that we are inclusive with, with people from this culture or that culture or, or, or this vocation or that vocation, that we also intimately engage with our natural kin. So what, what's the value of the humans forming a, an intimate organization to survive without including our relatives. So that we need to keep in mind the health, the soil. We need to be sure 
that, that, that we don't adopt practices that will harm the plants. Uh, this this monocropping scares the hell out of me because I saw what uh, I saw the 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 uh, research that was done on it. Um, in fact, the most blatant one is what happened in Ireland when they monocropped the potato. Literally, millions of people were impacted. Vast majority starved to death. Many came to America, and then there's these the varieties of bananas because of the monocropping. They are now extinct. And so if the focus is on let's form together so we can extract more value of a monetary form from the plants that have been gifted to us, uh, I think we may be, we, we may need to rethink, reevaluate. And you know what? Broaden our embrace. So we not only include each other, but we also include our kin, our natural environment. Our plants, our earth is alive. And I think together we can go far, not just us humans, but we need to go with everybody, everything and all of our relatives. Anyway, that's the lesson that uh, is most meaningful for me. Mahalo Nui Doc. Um... I'm not sure how, how we can follow that. That was just extraordinary. Do you have anything you'd like to say, Auntie Shirley? Just basically mahalo for being, for me to be able to be a part of the webinar, whatever we've all been trying to do at Ulu over the years. Um, and yes, there are many things we need to do to get go forward. But as I've said a number of times, we need to include our keiki in what we do, because they are our future. And so thank you, everybody. You've all been wonderful. Kalani. I best to you on your journey. See you home soon. Mahalo, Auntie Shirley. Auntie Shirley is a mom, a grandma, and a great grandma. And uh, she's a, a rebel, a rabble rouser, and she doesn't uh, hesitate to speak her mind. So she really is the Ulu Project here in Hawaii. Well, let's see, we have um, not a lot of questions in the Q&A box. Um, I'm just wondering, we have a little bit of time left. We have about 15 minutes. Who would like to, who would like to um, say some things that they haven't had a chance to say? I, I think it's been incredible that the, the theme of connectivity to nature through cultural landscapes, which is, um, Floris's introduction um, has has come through in, in everyone's uh, presentations. The values that we that we hold are key to the outcomes, and um, perhaps we can talk a little bit more about how how an indigenous perspective can be carried forward and uh, uh, to to transform the way we we relate to not only breadfruit, but all of the crops that we enjoy. So maybe I could, would, would you like to speak, Flores? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks again, everybody. That's, um, yeah, I'm, I'm full and my cup is full today, <laughs> which is wonderful conversation. Just one thing I forgot to mention was that, um, and what I think is really, really important in today's time, is that we need to take time to stop and celebrate breadfruit. We need to be able to, you know, really celebrate and um, and take and elevate uh, breadfruit in in different types of celebrations. Um, I think every year it should be celebrated, and in, in every crop um, that we have that that is at risk of. Um, you know, being underused or exploited or anything that we're trying to pull back on, 
I think should be celebrated. And in celebrating our food, um, we celebrate our traditions and our culture and ourselves and our connection to the land. Um, I really love what um, Bali'i had just uh, shared previously. Um, I feel exactly the same. I've had the same experience on the land and in, in the, I feel like I wasn't, I was re-educated all over again, going back to Samoa and going back onto my land. And I couldn't have done that in an institution of any sort. I would not have absorbed it the way that I have and, and have put such high um, importance on that in my life. And, and, and that's what kind of carries the journey that I have with the people that I work with and the people that I try to help or you know, the, the causes that I try to impact. So I thank um, our ancestors um, for the wisdom and for the teachings um, and for the awakenings, because I think once us, once we realize that, that, um, that gift of the land and, and the awakening that can happen for us there, um, I think we can all come together uh, collectively um, as a region and as um, Indigenous people and, and really um, impact other cultures and other people that need this wisdom as well. It's not just a wisdom about a food or that, it's, it's a wisdom about connectivity, as we say, and, and about growing together and celebrating um, the fellowshipping together and um, our traditional ways of doing and being and going back and eating from our cultural landscapes, which is beautiful. Yeah, thank you again. Mahalo, thank you so much. Who else would uh, like to say uh, some last words, perhaps Kyle? Uh, yeah, no, I think um, just uh, reflecting as uh, uh, some of my fellow presenters did on, you know, how we develop this crop. And if we choose to go down the same path, we, a traditional crop development path of uh, seeing how big you can make the farms and uh, how much you can increase the yield and uh, uh, that this exploitive um, uh, approach, um, we're going to face all of the same problems that all of these crops have. And that was articulated quite well. Um, but at the same time, uh, we, we are proposing uh, to develop breadfruit so that it does contribute to uh, livelihoods, so that it does uh, make an impact on, on food security and nutrition. So there is a way to develop breadfruit without going down this traditional path of crop development. And um, <laughs> we can look around in all of our Pacific Islands and we can see how prevalent breadfruit is, how prominent it was in the diet, and we can simply build upon that. So it's not uh, um, um, completely crazy, but we have to be aware that as we promote breadfruit, and it's already happening, farms are getting bigger. Uh, used to be, uh, if you find 50 trees, in one area, you're like, oh, wow, that's really big. But now you see 500 trees and 5,000 trees. And um, again, we will see with every crop that has developed along those lines, you meet new pests, you meet new diseases, and you find uh, problems that eventually um, uh, have solutions <laughs> that only result to more poisoning on the earth and things like that. So um, I think that uh, the, the uh, Pacific Island um, agroforestry systems that produce a lot of fruit, that are, are require minimal inputs, um, that are relatively resilient to pests, disease, natural disasters, these are the development model that we would really like to promote as a breadfruit people movement. And it's, uh, it's a proven technology. Thank you, thank you, Kyle. Wonderful. <clears throat> how about how about Kalani? 
Would you like to? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I got to build right on what Carl was saying. These whole system developments of creating commercial kitchens and uh, the manufacturing and processing stations for the whole community so that it's a co-op base and different families can share these facilities. I mean, give women in their local communities the ability to create economy and offset their local home economics with great fresh food while you're developing or harvesting means. One of the primary things is Western agriculture insists on machine harvesting. On we're gonna harvest all the apricots all at once. Right, and all of a sudden, everybody's got apricot jam, and for the next 11 months, no apricots, right? So that's not actually what happens with breadfruit, right? You guys all know the breadfruit is ready when it's ready, and it can be ready in a lot of different ways, right? It can be ready where it's underripe. It can be ready when it's just right. It can be ready when it's too ripe. It can even be ready now when it's fallen to the ground and fermenting. It all depends on what we're doing with it, right? And how we're doing with it. So this idea of shared co-op economics, where individual people at their households can harvest one or two fruits and bring you the other seven that they pulled that week for X amount, and then bring you the other 15 that fell on the ground for X amount also, right? They're selling you these levels of byproduct and they're making money to offset their family and food costs these ideas of of shipping functions being compromised in the near future i think are real stressors that we should be addressing today my grandfather used to say best time to plant the breadfruit tree was 10 years ago Right, the next best time is right now. So grab the shovel, right? It's like, so we need to get at creating the capacities that will assist our communities for real on the ground. And I think that's the important thing. We stay less pie in the sky and more bread food on the ground. Mahalo Nui, wonderful. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I forgot to mention, I keep putting on the picture because that's my mom and my wife. And I always want to acknowledge the women that make it possible for me to do anything. <laughs> you know, that's why I put their photo up when I'm not saying anything. So mahalo, you guys. Okay, uh, Doc Tracy, would you like to say a few words? <laughs> yeah. Um... First of all, I'd like to extend my humblest apologies to the state of Arkansas. <laughs> um, there was an impetuous statement instantly regretted, uh, but it was all meant in good humor. So, uh, Great points. Uh, thank you very much. It's been a delight. Uh, one of the things, uh, there's some real simple points here, and Kalani, uh, I think, encapsulated it well. These are the principles that we need to help guide us. One, that see to it that the children are well-fed and healthy, period. And everything that entails. The second thing, see that our elders are cared for with love and respect. That's simple. Thirdly, see that our women do not live, uh, they must live without fear, that they are protected and supported and allowed to carry on and contribute the way they always have as the foundation of society. And fourth, that we live with respect, love, and harmony with nature. Uh, those are wisdoms, actually, <laughs> that are as old as the islands. And we don't need to go to university or, or law school to, to, to learn this. All you have to do is listen. Talk to a tree, spend some time on the hill in the grassy knoll. Spend some time, reconnect with who you really are 
and then I think um, it's an exciting future we can look forward to, especially as we prepare and support our children. Lastly, we do have a breadfruit summit. We, we, we organize it every year since 2016. Uh, I'll send the information out once we can get it confirmed. It'll be in Hawaii on October uh, 17th and 18th. There, there are two events. And uh, we're inviting everyone who is involved and interested in breadfruit from the producers, manufacturers, to the farmers, to, to the people who are just interested, to the moms and pops. But uh, it's been very successful. And uh, we unfortunately had to cancel it because of COVID. So uh, the Global Breadfruit Summit is October, the Hawaii Convention Center um, later on this year. And look forward to seeing you all there. Aloha. Even people from Arkansas are invited. <laughs> yeah, I think that's our Kansas, right? Our Kansas. <laughs> wonderful, uh, wonderful. Well, I think may unless I have something. Ah, Auntie Shirley would like to have a word. I'd like. Um, I want to share this. We're talking about our keiki. Um, um, when I travel with Craig to various islands in the Pacific. I was just amazed and so felt so good, especially in Samoa, to see one or two ulu trees in all the yards that we happened to pass by. And that's something I want us to continue to do, and we've done it with Amy Greenwood Gardens through a grant, is to get ulu trees to families so that they will have a tree in their yards or maybe even at our public places. Keep it at a level where it will be easy, easy to harvest so that everyone can share in the goodness of Ulu. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Mahalo, Auntie Shirley. And who better to have the last word than our Auntie Shirley? Ouch. Thank you so much. Um, I would just like to thank again, Breadfruit people working with Kyle and Irene and working with Megan has been wonderful. Um, thank you to our uh, audience who, um, thank you for giving your time to this and putting your energy into our live event. And thank you to our panelists who have brought uh, lifetimes of of experience and knowledge and passion about uh, breadfruit and so many other things to the table. So um, with that, I believe we will end our yes, yes. webinar. Oh, I guess there's one last thing. What is this, Auntie Shirley? It's just ripe ulu that's been uh, baked. This with... is baked, baked um, uh, ripe ulu. Right. And yeah. does it? Mmm, that smells wonderful. Okay, well, we'll enjoy this. <laughs> it's like a pudding. It's a pudding, it's yes. It's like a pudding, yes. Okay. Man, <laughs> now I'm hungry. Uh, and I am too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And aloha. <laughs> <laughs>